Welcome to Main Street Podcast, an opportunity to talk to Idaho's elected leaders about the issues that matter to you. Welcome to the Main Street Idaho Podcast. I'm your host, Brennan Summers. We're here with a first-time guest out of District 26, Representative Jack Nelson, live from the Boise Capitol. Jack, give us some adjectives today to describe the legislature. Absolutely never a dull moment. And every time you think you might be a little bit bored, you need to think twice because you're missing something. <laughs> quite the privilege, quite the privilege to get to do it. And it's uh my gosh, the mental the mental drain on you through the day is just trying to stay up with everything. It's uh it's quite the challenge. Well, and, and you've got not one, not two, but three committees you sit on and three pretty important committees in education, agriculture affairs, and, uh, and conservation and resources. So uh, maybe briefly just tell us some of the big stuff happening in those committees. Well, issues really dear to my heart that came through education and the whole, it's uh, not just through education, it's come uh, through lots of people in the Capitol, but that's simply the... Uh, the uh, launch program. Launch to my constituency, I think, is probably one of the more important things we've done. This is the first time that, to me, the trades uh, have gotten any respect at all. And being able to put up a scholarship program for kids that come out of high school and they want a CDL, uh, this is the perfect uh, avenue to get get for them. And um, I really like the launch. I think it pays 80% of the uh, the costs, there's a little skin in the game, 20%. So I'm I'm expecting huge things. I think the first round of launch, 300 and some kids from my legislative district applied for it. So it's wow. uh, it's a super, super important to the people in the trenches in my uh in my community, healthcare, uh, all the trades, truck driving, things like that. Um, this is kind of the first time legislation with scholarships has really addressed those people. The uh, I was for six years I was a board member of the College of Southern Idaho, and a really neat portion of the college is their career technical education from welding to you name it, all the things that they do. And that's um, to me that's a really important part of a community like the Magic Valley that we've done to actually support them. Yeah, Representative, we talked with uh, Representative Wheeler last week, and his favorite three letters are CTE, right? And as you mentioned, career technical education. Help us understand why career technical education is getting so much attention right now and why it's so uh, so important to Representatives Wheeler, you, other people. In a general view, I think the the respect and everything has gone to bachelors and masters and doctorates. And the maybe a, those are all really important, but maybe they got a little bit overhyped here and they've certainly become overcharged. You look at, in a just a manner of speaking, you look at all the people that have huge debt, college debt that they can't pay. To me, that's a little bit of what you paid for. Yeah, you got took because you can't make cash flow payments on your on your debt. And it's, um, I think now maybe taking a little bit of focus off of degrees and putting it on skills, uh, for me, that makes really good sense. When your operating system on a food plant gets the flu, uh, you don't really care what credentials the person that fixes it has. You just want the thing fixed. And same with when you want your uh, personal computer fixed. You do, I've never gone in and just, well, what are your credentials? Either they can fix it or they can't. So. Uh, Launch is really important, and it's um, it's certainly not an issue of money. Some of these trades now are outpaying degree jobs, and the, if you click on, really for user, for ease of use, if you're a, a student or a parent, if you click on the launch site, it's uh, the Workforce Training Council is the uh, is the supervising agency. But on the first on the first click, it shows. What, uh, what are in-demand jobs? But click on the second one, and it shows you what the uh, average wage is in Idaho for those jobs. And everybody should do what they love. But if you love something that simply doesn't pay, maybe maybe you could look at a, a profession that's beside it that uh, 
would be just as uh, just as good for you. Yeah, I, I should probably get on there, Jack. My modeling career is not paying what I thought it would, so we may need to start over, and I'll uh, I'll end up in a food processing plant making a lot more than I would be as a model. Somebody might have led you astray there, kid. <laughs> I got took, as you would say, right? I got took. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so we, we love hearing about launch. We're excited. I think what can um, bring down the temperatures of a lot of people is the idea that we're going to look at how this plays out, and it's got an opportunity for some changes based on um, what the, what we need to change because this is a first time thing. So we're all excited. We know you've been a big advocate of that. So that that's eaten up a lot of space in the legislature. Uh, you're also, as I mentioned, sit on agriculture affairs and you've got an interesting background in ag. You've, you know, your way around the farm and a pitchfork and hay. Talk us through some of the issues you're wrestling with in that committee. Um, from a real general sense, <clears throat> I've always thought of Idaho as a really ag-centered state. You look at southern Idaho, uh, Magic Valley, eastern Idaho, ag is quite a driver in our communities. You come up to the legislature and there really aren't very many people that have spent their life in production agriculture. It's uh, crazy how important it is to our communities. And, uh, you know, that they everybody means really well in the legislature and they try really hard. But there's a little bit of a difference, I think, if you grew up around ag or, or you actually didn't. And it's uh, it's just a little bit different perspective up here than I would consider down in the Magic Valley. Well, and there are you're kind of a dying breed in the legislature. It used to be, there was the day where it was a lot of cowboy boots in committee. And now, you, you know, we have the Senator Harris's and we have the um, Burton Shaw's and we have the Raymond's and. And the Nelsons, and there's a few of you still left. Why is it so important that there are people who have had firsthand experience in agriculture helping draft the policy that affects our farmers and ranchers? And not to not to degrade anybody, but just the way the general public looks at all the ag issues is kind of what's been fed to you on your social media account. And we all know social media is wonderful, but Sometimes social media really doesn't have its roots in the truth or what makes things happen. And uh, it's hard to just keep pulling things back to a really ground level view of of how that affects us and stuff. Yeah, yeah, we get that. It's a it's an issue with Idaho. So much of Idaho's economy is dependent on agriculture, which means that so much of the issues you wrestle with in the state house is dependent on agriculture. Do you think that um do you think that our our policy is headed in the right direction when it comes with protecting family farms and ensuring that Idaho can still feed the world? That is so hard. I spent 20 years on a Jerome County Planning and Zoning Commission, and I guess the good way to describe growth in Idaho has been pretty much urban sprawl. Uh, sure. We've splattered people out all over the place, and real production agriculture, it doesn't it always loses. Every time somebody lives next to a, an ag operation, uh, whether it's time of day, smells, chemicals, uh, all the things that are tools that production ag has to have, uh, nobody really likes living around them. They were all sure when they moved out there, man, I got to get out there, you know, in the countryside. Well, when they get there, they're not so sure they like some of those uses. And it's really hard to it's really hard to get the two sides and they both need respect they both need respect but how you get those together without doing uh, a lot of damage to ag well you talk about urban sprawl and how things have changed i i think now's a good time to pause and go back to the beginning you grew up in the wood river valley now people have heard of the magic valley the treasure valley the snake river valley many probably the average idahoan uh, may not have heard of the Wood River Valley. Walk us through where it was that you grew up and what it was like. Well, I'm I'm a third generation northeast of Jerome farmer, dairy farmer. But I was lucky enough in my when I was a kid, I had a grandmother that lived up by Easley's. It's a oh 10, 15 miles north of Ketchum. She lived up there in a cabin all summer and we were lucky enough to get to go and visit my grandma. So that's kind of where I picked up my fishing sickness on the the big wood up there, learning to fish, and uh, and just a appreciation and a love for everything up there. But uh, 
since I was just a little kid, I've I've been on the farm and working, uh, grew up doing that. I'm sure the farm's changed in the last few years since you started on it in terms of technology, in terms of workforce and how they've managed all that. As your community evolves, as it grows, as it changes, what are the things that concern you and how you represent them in the in the capital? It's it's hard because everybody has a little bit different view of what should happen depending on their background and what they do. It's interesting the community of Jerome, having an ag base all my life. Now, one of the main drivers economically are the uh, are the food processing plants. Jerome's lucky enough that uh, True West Beef has built a plant there. We've got large dairy processors, and it's a whole different steady stream of jobs for people and input to the community that there really wasn't there for a long time. I think I'd also add, um, I think the world of my community, and I'm a huge advocate of local control, and it, it's always been hard for bedroom communities that uh, house the workers, if you will, and everybody drives somewhere else. Jerome, for most of my life, my opinion, has been a bedroom community. Uh, if you weren't working on the farm, you grow to twin or someplace to work. And that dynamic has changed a bunch now. And you can see it in the the ability of the uh, the local organizations to fund the things that they want to do. And, you know, you're... Your deep love of your community has been seen since, yeah, really you hit the campaign trail. I know when elected, you said it was your priority to build meaningful connections with your constituency. And um, and once in the Capitol, you made a comment about how you were going to leave ideology at the door and that your number one job was to represent your community. But we hear about ag and we hear about production and everything going on in, your, in, in District 26, but you have a very interesting constituency that you represent. You won in a, what might have been the closest election by you know less than 100 votes. You beat your Democratic opponent by. What did such a close election tell you about how your community wants to be represented? Well, if it ever wasn't there, I'm I think it was, but humility, I'd say, wears well on everybody. And our Jerome Lincoln Blaine or Blaine Lincoln Jerome, our communities by their voting record, it's just about a dead heat between R's and D's. Um, the only guy who lost less on less votes than me was my Democratic, uh, Ned Burns, who sits in the other seat from District 26. I think I won by a little over 80 and Ned won by a little over 30. So it tells you that our communities, they see things a lot differently. And uh, what's what's really on the people's mind in Ketchum and Sun Valley might not be what's on people's minds in Valley and Dietrich. Yeah. So a lot of your constituents aren't going in blindfolded and just checking don't, uh, donkeys and elephants. They're looking at the issues and they're looking for somebody that they know who's going to represent them. Uh, how, how do you how do you gather enough information to know that your constituency is not just incredibly homogenous and that they say, this is exactly what we want and every time we want it, now you go do it and we'll be okay. You, you've got a little bit more complicated of a job. Personally, uh, I think everybody ends up being, you're balancing your constituency with what your basic beliefs are. I uh, I always have loved that uh, saying that we're spending someone else's money. It needs to be done transparently, reasonably, and very carefully. And uh, I've taken a few pretty lonely votes. I have a hard time voting for a law that's a cookie cutter from across the nation. It's in court everywhere. And to jump in there and say, man, we got to pass this in Idaho and spend a bunch of hard-earned tax dollars from my view, in in court, if you will. Uh, coupled with that is a really strong belief in local control. That's been a it's been a little bit of an issue for me personally of where you come down on it. In the community up in uh, Blaine County, the Blaine County School Board has not had public testimony coming through uh, COVID. They went to a written policy, and the school board is really uh, they like it. And on the other side, I've had a bunch of people in the community talking to me, uh, 
they think that's bad news that a public board simply doesn't allow public testimony. And uh, a bill started in the Senate. I asked if I could be a sponsor on it and simply to help get to be in the kitchen, if you will, and help uh, help uh, from the idea to get with the bill that doesn't really do harm. And it's, uh, I think it's, it's, it's headed for the house now, or the, excuse me, it's headed for the, uh, it's headed for the house floor. It, it came through, uh, through the house committee. And uh, the hard part, I'm torn both ways. You have to respect your local community. If, uh, if an issue is, it can be decided just as well in a county commissioner or a school board meeting as it can be decided on the floor of the house, I think we should stay out of that. This one, uh, the bill, it's hard for me as local control guy to vote for this, but I like it. It doesn't say how you have to do it. It just simply gives the local board a little bit of a nudge that you uh, you need to have some uh, testimony by your by your community. Yeah. So we've seen on a national level a lot of politicians who find themselves somewhat in the center, you know, they're center left or center right. They're kind of bowing out of politics because the the primary system makes it really difficult for somebody who leans to the center to be able to win in a primary race because the primary intrinsically favors uh, more base core voters. Do you ever fear that you're becoming more and more uh, extinct because you, you're not a, a deep red ideologue or uh, you're certainly not a, a blue Democrat? As you as you lend to independent thinking in the legislature and take what you describe as lonely votes, does it weigh on you that that you may not have a path forward? Uh, of course, it weighs on everybody. But I, frankly, I'm going to run. For, I'm running for re-election. I filed the other day, but I didn't come up here to be a uh, a career politician or to do what you know one side or one group that rates people. And oh my gosh, we're going to give you a bad rating. I'm kind of a knock yourself out kind of guy. I vote with my community and my beliefs and. Uh, the voters will have to sort that out. But you're right, a closed primary, um, it tilts the it tilts the vote one direction. And then in my district, you open it up to a general election and it absolutely tilts it the other way. So I, uh, unless it's tomorrow, I probably won't die in office, but it's quite the privilege to get to do this. And and at the end of the day, it will be your community that decides whether or not you get rehired. And that's that's the beauty of democracy is you get to represent them and you get to represent the votes. Now, I had to make sure I got through the three L's in this interview. So you'll notice number one was launch. Number two was local control. And number three is Lava Ridge. <laughs> so speaking of issues that are important to your community, uh, so many in your constituency has been very vocal in opposition of the Lava uh, Ridge Wind Project. But there are some in Idaho that probably aren't familiar with it at all. Can you briefly tell us what is the Lava Ridge Wind Project and where are you at on the issue? I'm adamantly opposed. I uh, co-wrote and co-presented through the House Committee, House Floor, and Senate Committee the the resolution that um, that we passed last year. Uh, of how anti-lava ridge we were. And in my perspective, the community should be really upset about this. From my view, it's being rammed down their throat with absolutely no consideration for the impacts on the local community. If you own a business in these small rural communities, and they're going to bring in 2,000 temp workers for a couple of years and then pack up and leave, we don't have places to live now or can afford the places that we have. What in the world is going to happen then? Little school districts that graduate maybe 30, 40 kids. What do you do when here's here's 40 kids shows up at the show up at the door and in a year or two, uh, they're all going to be gone. It's just all these issues. And maybe the I'd like to circle back with you and, and do one, possibly get one of Representative Simpson's reps here on your program. But uh Representative Simpson put a rider on a uh, budget bill and it passed the House and the Senate, and I believe President Biden signed it. So it says that the BLM has to come back, talk to the local community, and then report back to Congress. And the thing that would help my community the most is the guidelines of what's fair to comment on and what not. 
if you're um, if you haven't been around the desert very much, um, you, most people look at desert and just say, ah, it's that old ugly sagebrush desert. Frankly, a lot of us down there we really like our uh, desolate-looking sagebrush desert. Lava Ridge Project, if there weren't federal uh, incentives behind it, my opinion is it would never have shown up to be a project. But the original proposal was 400 windmills that are the largest, I think about the largest they have uh, to put on land, 400 and, or 570 feet. We have a restaurant in Twin, elevation 486. It's 486 feet, I believe, above the the canyon floor. So if you dropped one of these windmills in the canyon beside the Perrine Bridge, there would, there would still be over 100 feet of windmill sticking up above the Perrine Bridge. Uh, to go in and put 400 of these in, uh, four to 500 miles, excuse me, four to 500 miles of roads that they're going to put in, they have to blast holes about 45 feet deep for concrete to anchor the things. If you've been down there, I guess the easiest example would be if you drive north out of Shoshone, there's a bowling alley on the north end. And right beside the bowling alley is this huge air bubble back in the day that popped, if you will, uh, when this country was uh, was setting up the Yellowtone blowtorch ge uh, geologically. Uh, we're a pretty young, young substrate or, or land down there. Uh, north of Jerome, if you drill wells, it's a... Uh, it's almost a, a flip of the coin. Are you going to hit a layer of cinders and have to case the well down? Or are you going to just uh, be able to get away without doing that? Canal companies blasting canals and altering them. They've had to go in and replace a bunch of domestic wells. If you've ever served on planning and zoning, for my opinion, when the approved stamp goes on something, you don't walk in later and say, oh, by the way, here's a problem that you caused, we'd like you to fix it. Well, of course, local citizens can go to court, but unless it's actually in the permit that if the aquifer has issues, that the company would have to be responsible for it. So those, sure. are, those are kind of some highlights. And I think the grumpiest part is just walking right over the top of the locals and assuming this is going to happen. The Japanese internment camp, Minidoka out there, uh, all the people that relatives or there's still a few survivors that were interned there and um the the disrespect of slapping those right up next to them um, it's just i get that really the challenge would be in my community find anybody that is for lava ridge yeah, I was going to say that, that maybe somebody in the state is for it, but I haven't heard from him. And Congressman Simpson has certainly on the D.C. level been doing everything he can to pull funding and to yeah, to kind of halt the brakes on that one. But again, it goes back to your point of local control, right, of what's going up in your backyard and, and how the locals should have a say. Now, we know you're pretty busy, Representative, but we have a tradition here we got to end with. Everyone that comes on the podcast gets asked two of the toughest questions. The first question is, if there was one book that you've read in your lifetime that you would recommend to our listeners, what is a book that you could recommend? Boy, that's tough. I have a. I told you they were tough questions. I have a sickness of fishing. <laughs> I uh, some fly tying books and some websites would be really great, but maybe the the one that made the biggest impact on me was probably Fever in the Heartland. It goes back to the age of the Ku Klux Klan in the upper Midwest and how what what led to the the fall of the Klan, if you will, why it why it went sideways and uh, how many people bought into something that later they were pretty ashamed of. Yeah, that, that's a Timothy Egan. Great. We, we love his books have been recommended a lot by your colleagues over there. Uh, I thought you were going to say a river runs through it, but we'll take fever in the heartland. That's a good one. Now, the second question might be a little easier. In your district, beautiful District 26, I'm driving through there. What's one place you'd recommend I need to stop and grab something to eat? I'd say without picking one out in particular, I'd get in tons of trouble on that. But we have some of the neatest Mexican restaurants that have wonderful food anywhere. It's always sad when I travel and somebody says, hey, we got this great Mexican restaurant. So we go in there and uh, it just simply doesn't compare with the, 
with the neat choices we have in Jerome. So absolutely all of our restaurants. It's um, We don't have a lot of tourists coming through Jerome, if you will. And for a place to be in business, they have to have great food. The flip side is it's quite the opportunity to go up to uh, Ketchum, Sun Valley, and all the vast array of restaurants that are up there. So um, I'll step around that as a politician. Yeah, yeah, that was a really clever step around. I mean, um, I'm a certified seafood guy. If I, I oh. see it, I pretty much eat it. <laughs> I love it. So you got Mexican food a little bit better than Taco Bell and uh, some other great classics. Representative, we really do appreciate your time. We've talked about everything from launch, local control, Lava Ridge, and everything in between. So we appreciate what you're doing there. Uh, we're going to have you back once this session winds down and ends, and we can talk about everything that was accomplished and what you're looking forward to in an upcoming session. But until then, we wish you well. Thanks for all that you do. It's quite the pleasure to be here. Thanks, Representative.